Right, let's let's kick things off here. Um, so I have the con, uh, control over here in in the UK um, uh, to all our Canadian audience who may not be familiar with me. Uh, my name's Jasper Lawler, one of the market analysts over here in London. Um, Colin uh, and I are going to be discussing the various factors going on in the market. Um, but uh, technology-wise, it's, it's just a little easier for me to be uh, directing the kind of proceedings in terms of how the charts move around. So, um, Colin, you'll have to bear with me in terms of when you're describing your trend lines or however this goes. So, it's been a, an interesting week so far. Um, we in this uh, correction has, has finally taken place a little bit in the in equity markets after this massive run that we had since since the first big correction it's ended mid october colin what are you uh, what are you putting this correction down to i think there's two things that's uh, that's basically impacting the market here the first one is is general exhaustion we've seen markets go basically straight up for 6 weeks solid and and they're just exhausted here and they're due for a rest and and this is coming in at a time when news flow is drying up we're getting close to the end of the year there's uh, not as much economic news we're past the end of earnings season so there's not much corporate news we're heading into the uh, the two week holiday slowdown uh, coming up after the end of next week so uh, there's, we're just to the point where there's nothing really to push them farther so they're starting to come back under their own weight and uh, and there were two things that uh, that in particular struck me uh, I'll talk about the, the US first and then I'll, I'll go to the DAX so one of the excuses that we're seeing uh, coming down is the, the, the collapse in crude oil prices and what this has done for the uh, energy stocks and the energy sector dragging things down and we haven't seen the positive impact of lower oil prices work their way through yet. People are more worried about crude oil, particularly as it's falling and, and testing $60 today. But the other part is, uh, and maybe we could go to first, is uh, Jasper, could you bring up the, the Germany 30 chart? Yeah, of course. Uh, this was, uh, well, I was sitting here looking at the DAX last Friday and seeing it at all-time highs, and, and everything you've been hearing about the German economy is that it's been in trouble and it's, it's it's rolling over, and because Germany is doing badly, the ECB has got to bring in new stimulus. And something doesn't jive. It's like even if you do bring new stimulus, so it does, it wasn't all adding up. And and if you look here, you now have uh, as as Jasper shows, you've now got a big double top in in the in the Germany 30. You've got one back in June, which was actually a, a triple top, and now you've got where Jasper's put the arrows here, uh, another significant top. For the DAX, and and this one is is more of a a breakdown on on the basis that the uh, that the, the fundamentals are weak, that the European economy is rolling over, and, and the DAX is coming down basically as it should be. Did you yeah. want to add to that, Jasper? Yeah. And maybe you I want mean, to talk about the auction this morning. Yeah, it is um it is a bit of a laugh when you see um, markets make new all time highs, yet there's talk of borderline deflation and a contracting economy. Um, it, uh, it certainly doesn't quite add up, and I suppose the only reason it does add up is that the markets weren't really trading off the uh, fundamental basis of the economy. It was just purely a, a play on stock markets being one of the primary beneficiaries of potential QE from the ECB. And um, even though it didn't make a lot of sense, I mean, what was your feeling when, um, you know, when we sort of there was a few levels on the way up which you sort of, I certainly personally sort of felt could have. You know, this this area was almost a sort of topping formation. It would have made sense for things to roll over. But when you saw things break up here again, I think there was just some sort of jawboning by Mario Draghi saying that, you know, quantitative easing was imminent. What What, what is your feeling at this point? Even though you know fundamentally uh, it doesn't make sense as far as the economy, do, do you still try and ride this trend higher or do you wait for the top? How are you How are you looking at this as this was uh, was progressing? I think this whole thing has been liquidity driven primarily, uh, both especially the last six weeks. Cause remember, this whole thing started when the uh, when the U.S. Uh, one of the Fed governors came out and said, "Oh, maybe we won't end QE after all because the the, the markets were crashing and they were yeah. down 10 yeah, percent." Right about here. And, <laughs> yeah, right about there. And that that says to me, and, and in hindsight, I, I figured this out a week later. That was the plunge protection team stepping in, and you know, people debate on whether or not it exists. So let's see. A Fed member comes out and. Nobody had ever talked about ending QE until the market went down 10%. Then yeah. it has a massive rebound. And, oh, well, maybe we'll end it after. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty, one of the most blatant appearances of the, of the PPT I've ever seen. It was, it's so painfully obvious. But anyways, you've got, so now you've got the, um, you've got the, the DAX screaming higher to new all-time highs on, on, 
supposedly more QE coming from the ECB, and, and you've got the, the, the Dow screaming to new all-time highs, even though the QE3 is over and they're talking about raising interest rates. So mm. something's got to give. One of the, one side is right and one side is wrong, and you can't have both of them at new all-time highs at the same time in that kind of environment. So I think what we're seeing now is that things are starting to crack and, and things are starting to crumble, and, and, um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens next month at the ECB meeting, particularly in, in light of uh, the LTROs this morning were, I guess you had said, in line with expectations, but I think there's still, w w the original program was supposed to be $400 billion. It was 200 and change, and okay. uh, just a little bit of change. So it's, oh, they, only, they only did about half of what they were hoping to do over, over the two tranches, and um, and and you got to wonder the the ECB balance sheet, which I keep an eye on every week, is is only up marginally off of its lows in in September. So it, it's it's uh, you know hard to, is is the question going into next year is are they going to get serious or not? Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, this did feel like a bit of a turning point this um, this last meeting where um, Draghi has been fairly successful in the last few meetings of doing next to nothing but really talking about all the possibilities and uh, the market just didn't quite buy it this time you saw that initial i think that was the moment the dax made its its peak was just prior to the ecb meeting uh, was sort of this and uh and then just right on that same day just the market you know the stocks came right off just really not believing um that uh that QE is, uh, well, obviously disappointed that QE didn't take place in that particular meeting, or at least it wasn't well signposted that it would start next year, um, and just, you know, some definite questioning going on that it will ever take place. Um, this this little rally, I mean, it's no coincidence, came right up to the high, just pushed a little bit higher, and then we just got the kind of double top formation. What, what are you, technically at the moment, uh, Colin, looking at this double top we saw a bit of a move down sort of hovering around the um, sort of neckline type area here getting a retest again you see there's a slight chance of this one failing what, what do you what do you think here I mean it's uh, you know, it's looking to me like it's ready to fail and, and even I was looking at the Dow this morning and it kind of popped back up to 10 6 and and it was starting to fail as well so when you start seeing these these support lines get broken and then come in as resistance is is clearly bearish for a uh, bearish signal for the uh, for the market, and yeah. even though down here at the bottom you've got an acceleration in the RSI, that's just a, a trading bounce as long as that stays below 50, and uh, and so as you start seeing the lower lows and even the rebounds get contained by previous support levels, that's generally speaking a sign that we're into a into a correction, and we haven't really corrected very much. We've still got some some downside just to the. Um, like the 23% retracements, or the or or you know 50-day moving averages, or things where you often see corrections go to first. There, there's still quite a bit of downside before you reach those kind of points. Yeah, I mean it's been interesting to compare the um, Germany 30 with the UK 100, which saw a sort of similar formation, and this one's just completely tanked down to the 50% mm -hmm. uh, retracement. Obviously, having not even made uh, new all-time highs, not even the highs from from September, um, you know, the UK is looking a lot weaker here, and I guess that maybe does relate slightly to this whole oil scenario, Colin. Where uh, in the UK we do have mm -hmm. um, some oil production still taking place, so we're not a total uh, beneficiary of of lower oil prices as an economy, and um, mm -hmm. we do obviously have some major oil companies on the on the FTSE 100, so. Absolutely. I think the FTSE is one of the more uh, higher weighted for energy indices out there and probably of the of the big indices, probably the one that's the biggest. It would be like the UK index and the, like the Canada and Norway and Russia indices obviously would be would be next in terms of their uh, their oil exposure. But particularly to, to big caps as a percentage, I think you'd be looking at the UK. Even in the US, there, there's a number, obviously a number of, of big, big, big oil companies in there, but as a percentage of the overall index, they're not actually that big. Even at the peak, I think, I think oil topped out at something around 14% of the S&P. Mm. Whereas when you look at like um, a healthcare or a tech or financials, top out above twenty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So even if it and if it with it coming back down, maybe it ends up around uh, eight to ten percent of the S and P. It's not, it's not, it's not one of the big sectors. It's it's still one of the smaller sectors in the uh, in the U S index relative to to what it is in in some of the other indices in in Canada. It's twenty percent or more. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it's funny how they, uh, you know, you've always got to be careful when you when you are looking at markets in general, when you're working with the indices. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. when you're looking at the trend, you know, you've just got to go off that. But we did have an example where um, the FTSE has had a bit of a rejigging in the, in the last month, and, and Petrofac um, came out, and we've got a, a few house builders come in. So it's a sort of slight rejigging of the sectors. Um, so you've got to be aware of this indices type effect when you are looking at um, the uh, markets in general. If the FTSE had remained the same, it it could be even worse right now. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. That's why you want to keep an eye on the on the weightings of all the indices that you're trading. Colin, so because you sectors are important. Taking a look at this, um, just sort of technically for for a minute, when you're you're looking at this, kind of, this is one of those kind of more difficult trading scenarios, isn't it? Where you know this is the kind of beautiful time, obviously, isn't it? When you just see it's just small corrections, trend higher, you know which way the market's going, um, well, you've got a good sense that it's going higher, and it's just a matter of how how big the the correction is. Um, theoretically, you can buy it at any point in this this trend as long as you've got the trend up. You know, you can get the trade right. Uh, timing doesn't have to be so expert, but when you get a big move down like this, um, do you do you consider this a, a time to be looking for pullbacks to sell, or are you looking at kind of a bigger picture here, you know, looking at a, a sort of weekly chart, and just thinking about kind of equity sentiment in general, because it's been a, you know, mugs game for the last few years, hasn't it, trying to mm -hmm. pick top in stocks. Um, you know, you look at a large weekly candle like that. Do you, do you uh, does is that reason for that looks to, to me like a, a yeah that looks to me like a pretty decisive turn downward and mm -hmm. and of course a failure at a lower high which the lower high I definitely think is due to oil because it, it, we uh, we saw the same thing in in, in some of the resource other resource indices like Canada and Australia and others when we had this rebound all the resource ha more heavily weighted to resource indices failed at a lower high, but uh, that's a huge engulfing, bearish weekly engulfing candle there. You can't ignore that, and, and at this point, you've got to be thinking that people would be fading into lower highs, that even if you do get a bounce, you'd be looking at people would be thinking more sell the rally than buy the dip at this uh, at this point in time, and th this could continue for a few weeks until you get some kind of washer, but if you look at that broader channel there, uh, with, with this kind of a, a Technical breakdown. You could over over a few weeks see a retest of that lower boundary. Yeah, it does sort of certainly look like that, doesn't it? It looks like, and even if just following these moving averages, I don't know what moving averages you typically like to look at, Colin. I don't even see your chart forums because of the nature of the way the platform splits up. But um, you can even sort of see here that you know it's been even though it was within this wider range, it was sort of following the the, the averages higher, and the trend was, but it just wasn't quite making the new highs, it was just making the, the higher lows and the range was contracting into essentially a sort of triangle and it broke down big there and this is almost like a, a retest of that rising triangle beneath trend line. I don't think there is a perfect trend line you can draw there but you know, that's the kind of overall pattern and so it sort of you, it just sort of looks like that would be step number one and you know you could even be moving down here. I mean we don't have quantitative easing going on in, in, the, in the UK or it doesn't look like it's going to be coming anytime soon um, so you know, what is there? in the UK to hold things up. Maybe the ECB, but we're certainly not as big a beneficiary as they are in Europe. That's right. And actually, while you're talking about the central bank, something I thought that was interesting this morning was uh, the UK coming out and talking about switching from monthly meetings to uh, eight meetings a year. And, and, and what intrigued me about that is that here in North America, the, the eight meetings a year is standard. Both the Fed and the, uh, the Bank of Canada meet at once every six weeks. Yeah. So I'm one, and I'm curious about what you guys were thinking over there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 been a sort of simultaneous plan from the the ECB are planning on doing the same, and uh, now the Bank of England's following suit. Uh, cynically, you'd just say that they're um, you know they they want to work a bit less, <laughs> but I suppose what they're <laughs> attempting to do is um, is remove a bit of volatility surrounding the meetings because particularly with the ECB every single meeting there's expectations that they're going to do something um i suppose if you spread it out a bit um you know you're theoretically reducing the kind of volatility around it and putting less emphasis on the uh, the central bank even though in these times at zero interest rates obviously the emphasis is always going to be there but um and with the with the bank of england they're putting the minutes out at the same day as the uh they release the um uh, the results as well, so you know you haven't got that kind of bi-weekly effect anymore. It's not going to be every month. It's not going to be every you know we have what 
you have the uh, the result of the the rate hike or rate cut or keeping the same as it has been for the last five years, and then two weeks later the minutes. It's all going to be in one, happening every six weeks essentially. So, going to be hearing a bit less from the Bank of England and the European Central Bank next year. Just all their yeah. um, just all their jawboning in between. Interesting. I think because of that also, you may get more bang out of every meeting. Like if you're, you're sitting there every month, oh, they haven't done anything again and again and again and again. I think that way, by cutting a, a few less meetings that uh, that you may get more of a focus on each one and that and that perhaps, especially with the ECB, you may see more pressure on them to actually do something at a, at a meeting since they're not so often. It could, it could be, uh, it'll be quite interesting to see what comes of all that. Yeah, maybe, maybe news trading becomes uh, a bit more of a sort of... Uh viable technique if we're looking for sort mm -hmm. of uh, you know if we're trading the euro around these ECB meetings or the st or sterling around these meetings you know if we get a few more pips gained in and around the announcements then you know just any kind of uh, you know for those of you who have tried trading the news results what you'll often see is just the price fire off in one direction often with a sort of gap in between just because of the nature of the way the market works you know you've got market makers out there who have a certain decision about where they want to price the market, a bid and an ask before the result, after the result, they're pricing the market somewhere different and there's nothing that happens in between. So you get a big gap and it's very difficult to trade that. But if there is going to be an extra number of pips after that gap takes place because of the sort of uh, extra emphasis and importance of the, the meeting because they've happened less often, might make the technique uh, a bit easier to pull off. Do you, do you ever try anything along those lines, Colin? Uh, not with trading, no. But uh, there's certainly uh, no doubt that with the, um, uh, uh, particularly around the uh, around the Fed meetings, even more than the Bank of Canada, because they haven't done anything in four years. But uh, every Fed meeting gets a lot of attention here, uh, both before and afterwards. No question about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess well, when we're talking about the sort of Fed and things, it's been interesting to look at uh, a gold. Um, you know, it was looking pretty bad at one point, Colin, when we when we had this decline through this long time support of mm -hmm. uh, 1180 and um, uh, to myself to my credit I put out a, a video saying that you know this is the the beginning of the end we've broken through uh, we're looking at sort of uh, sub $1,000 gold well it's not quite been the case yet still could be but um, almost a bit of a shakeout beneath that 180 what, what, are, what are you making of it? Yeah, I think we had a pretty good washout there. I think what happened was uh, that was the surprise in which what changed things was that the um, the Indian India, India dropping their import quotas uh, just in time for wedding season, and I think that's what's turned that what turned it around in the short term. But yeah. you're still struggling here, and and the reality is is the gold is it goes back to the ECB again and. Over the last five years, which I know we don't have a chart on this, so I'll just explain quickly. Over the last five years, gold has gone up with the EC balance sheet and it's gone down with the BCB balance sheet. So when the, the ECB was flooding the system with money uh, a few years back to, to deal with Greece and everything, it totally took off and, then, and, and so did gold. And then the last couple of years, the reason why gold's been coming down, people thought, you know, I, I originally thought, and I was wrong, I thought gold would above, go above 2000 when the Fed brought in QE3. What ha instead, it came down to uh, to uh, under twelve hundred, and, and what happened was that that gold's been following the the euro balance sheet, and, and what's the euro balance sheet shrank by a trillion euros over the last two years as banks paid off all the the, the first round of LTRO loans. Mm -hmm. So now we're at a turning point, and, and so we've gotten this nice bump from India, and uh, and perhaps gold got oversold, and we've had some short covering and people getting squeezed out of positions. But at some point, that's going to run out, and then we go back to the ECB, and we have to say, well. For the last six months, the ECB has been talking about uh, rebuilding its balance sheet and putting that trillion euros back in. They haven't done it. Um, even the, the first LTRO option never really did much for its uh, its balance sheet because banks were still paying repaying off the old ones. And uh, and so we're at a point where we're only thirty forty billion up off the low. And uh, and we've, they've still got a long way to go, and, and today's auction will help a little bit, but but not a huge amount. And so the the, the question is, are, how are they going to step up next year to really get it going? And if they really get uh, asset buying going and, and get serious about reinflating their balance sheet, that would be good for gold. If it doesn't, and and they stall again, we could see gold stall at one of these levels and and, and roll back down again. So. It depends on a lot. I think is really hanging. The gold market's really hanging on the ECB at this point. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I guess in terms of its sort of uh, 
you know, it's a kind of longer term range. You you can see that it's um, you know, like you said, we had this massive period of expansion, contraction, but then there's been neither or, and so we've been stuck in this uh, sideways range. And um, mm -hmm. even though it did break out here, that wasn't quite the fundamental catalyst for it to actually happen. I mean, obviously people, you know, you look at gold um, making that multi-year low, and then you look at the DAX making its all-time highs, German buns at record lows. The, clearly the the bet out there is that the ECB is going to do something, but the matter of the fact is they haven't actually done it yet, so there's only so far it can go. Yeah, the one thing I do think is I think we're in for increased turmoil in Europe next year, and that may be the catalyst that finally forces them back to do something just like it did in, in 2011 when when the crisis really hit. Um, my, I've been looking ahead to next year. Yeah, I, yeah. I suspect that Syria that is going to get in and uh, and shake things up, which in some ways – is a concern in some ways it's it would be helpful because the last two years I think they've just kind of taken advantage of the lull to and, and frittered their time away and I don't think they've done enough on either side the the political side or the central bank side to really deal with the uh, the problems that were out there I think they've they've kind of taken this as a as a uh, Oh great, things settled down. I guess we've done enough. When really they had and things settled down, and they had a two-year honeymoon that they, as far as I'm concerned, they frittered away. So maybe they yeah. need a kick from uh, a kick from something, whether it's uh, the the potential Greek elections, from the UK elections, from from something else, from a recession in Germany or or whatever hits. Uh, and, and I think I think several things could hit next year. It could be all of them or, or none of them, I mean, who knows. But the point is I think it will finally hopefully kick them into gear to make them do something. Mm. Well, that, I guess that is the ultimate counter-argument um, from the, you, know, you hear a lot from Germany is that if the ECB do go ahead and do some kind of QE, then, um, of course, you know we can expect good things in, in equity markets. But in terms of the actual European economy, it does just allow – the um, status quo to continue without any structural reforms because the governments needn't bother because borrowing rates are still going to be so low as bonds get bond prices get pushed further higher and uh, you know the the impetus is going to be taken away from them you know they you know the I've, mm -hmm. I've literally heard German ministers say that they need to feel a bit of pain to actually feel the need to to do something to change. Yes, and uh, we, we've started to see Treasury yields creep higher. I mean, Greece has took off, and everybody else is starting to creep up, but not enough yet to uh, to get the politicians' attention. But uh, sooner or later, that's what the, you're right. That's what they need is, some, is the kind of thing like uh, like rising Treasury yields to make them actually uh, actually do what they need to do. Mm. How, how you? I've pulled up the old uh, Euro chart here, Colin. Um, you know, let mm -hmm. me know whatever chart you want to look at. Obviously. Um, sure, this is good. Yeah, After this, let's do crude, but let's do uh, Euro dollar first. Yeah. Okay. So good, this yeah, is yeah. interesting, and gold looks the same kind of way in that uh, you know we've been in this short-term downtrend and trying to break out of it. Uh, today, I see we we got we, they ran right into a wall at 125 even, yeah. and uh, and slumped back a little bit. It is trying to bust this downtrend. So, I mean, I take this as a sign that that, that people that the uh, that the LTROs were less than people thought. And that perhaps I don't know. I guess you could go one of two ways. You could either say uh, it was enough, as you were saying, I believe earlier, it was enough to that perhaps the ECB doesn't have to move right away in January and they can figure out what they're going to do, mm -hmm. and and buy them some time. Or the other side was it's just so short of uh, the the, um, the the 400 billion original target that that clearly the the uh, they're not as stimulative as people had thought. So yeah. you, you could read it both ways. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, absolutely. It sort of seems like uh, the, you know, quantitative easing still seems the sort of assumption of most, but it's just a matter of timing. And so, um, you know, if that timing gets pushed out a bit to uh, maybe later in the first quarter or even past that, then you've got to believe there's, well, you know, even though that's, it looks like it's coming, it's not actually come yet, and that maybe would give the euro a bit of a room for maneuver higher, but... Oh, for now, Maybe back to the top of that channel anyway. Right, right, exactly. Probably, like you said, um, probably not much beyond that just because still, I mean, the trend is the st trend is still down below this sort of 50 to 5 day MA and still fundamentally um, comparably between Europe and the US. You know, US, you got multi-year highs in monthly job creation. Europe, you've got record low 
um, employment in the likes of Italy. So it's, it's that massive disparity. I mean, it's how how far can the euro really go higher? Yeah, and I'm looking at the uh, on the euro. I keep a look at the RSI, which you've got down at the bottom there, mm -hmm. and it keeps failing at 50. Yeah. So you you really, if you you can't you any rally you see is is a bear market rally until you see that really get through 50 for real. Yeah. Otherwise, you've got to assume that these are just dead ca uh, these are just uh, bounces along the way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I like. Um, yeah, I don't know how you uh, do it in the R cycle. You obviously mentioned the key. The 50 is the the most important, obviously. So you can mm -hmm. broadly say that while the RSI is under 50, the trend is down. While above, it's above. Uh, but then you can also use the the. Uh, I haven't actually got it drawn in on this chart for whatever reason, but um, oh, I do a little bit. Um, with these lines are looking a bit awkward, but you can use the 40 and the 60 levels as well. Sometimes offer sure. a bit of sort of interim support. And so what there is, um, I forget the name of the analyst. You probably know Colin. You did the CMT, but uh, they're having the, the the bull and the bear zones within the RSI. So it can be yeah, the RSI can be a sort of leading indicator from when you, for example, go from an extreme oversold area like this. You can get mm -hmm. up to just the 30 zone that can be an area to sell but then you also come up to the 40 you know that could act as some resistance and you see it corresponding with the, the price coming off there but then finally it came up to the 50 level and that is then where it eventually just wasn't able to hi go higher and the, the downturn resumed um if you could if yep. you had actually seen some kind of move up to 60 perhaps and then it bounced down to 50 and then it held above 50 that will sometimes correspond with a, a change in the direction of the trend uh, yes, if you see support on the RSI, which has come up to about 35, if you see that start to hold 40, is uh, is encouraging for an upturn as well, and, and you may see that before you see the break of 50. Either one would be uh, would be bullish technically. Um, Andrew Cardwell, that's the one for any of those for those of you <laughs> interested in uh, who have your collection of technical analysis textbooks that you're building up. That that's that's one to check out. Um, so, you, okay, so you mentioned, uh, what do you look Let's at? Let's do today? WTI. Yeah, yeah, well, it's um, down in some new five-year lows today. This is the kind of bigger picture, the the weekly chart. As you can see, it pretty much a straight line down. Then that uh, has totally, totally broken down. That's a massive, massive trend line. It's taken out a long-term support, lowest levels in the decade. And today, for the second time, it's testing 60. And uh, and so far, 60 is held. It's bounced off of it twice this week. Yeah. The the question is, how long did it last? The, the the bounces haven't been very enthusiastic, and they keep peaking at lower highs. And maybe it gets washed out for the short term. But I still think this downtrend's intact. You can see it's getting pretty oversold down on the bottom there. Mm -hmm. But uh, but as we saw with the yen and, and looking at it the other way, things can get oversold and stay oversold for quite a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you might get the odd trading bounce here, but I don't think they're going to get very far. And um, the next measure of support was around 56 and a quarter, but I have a gut feeling I think you're going to see a test 50 before this is all said and done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's, that's um, a psychological thing, and I think you're going to need. It's not going to end until you get some kind of real, real capitulation and, and real washout, and and something that really freaks people out and gets their attention and it could be that I think maybe 50 is, yeah. is a possibility yeah the, I, um, I sort of thought it was interesting when we had the uh, the OPEC meeting and um, the sort of talk, talk uh, before and after and it did seem like there was almost a bit of a coordinated message amongst a lot of these oil ministers that at the time um, I think a bit post the meeting uh, the it was about $70 a barrel um, and a lot of the ministers came out and said, uh, we think it's probably dropping down to 60, but that's where the market should settle. And so that mm -hmm. was a sort of convenient $10 below the current price level. And you sort of think, well, maybe they're, you know, they're trying to be a bit hopeful there, but they sort of think perhaps it can actually go to 50. So looking at those sort of $10 increments, you sort of think just on, uh, just on that, on that little theory alone, sort of 50 somehow makes, somehow makes some kind of sense. And um, sort of technically, we can say that you know 50 does obviously make sense here is where we had this kind of basing after that massive correction in 2008 mm -hmm. we sort of had the breakout there the touch back on 50 and then uh and then we saw what that was that low back then around 35 yeah um you wait low that one 35 11 35 and change yeah yeah so well, i guess that's that's a distinct possibility 35 do you think colin or 
fifty is gonna well, offer a bit of resistance there. I think fifty because I'm yeah, I think the two thousand and eight probably was more of an overshoot to the downside because you had the financial crisis and the recession. Mm-hmm. Where this time you've got it happening in at least in the United States and the UK reasonably robust economic times. Yeah. So I don't think you'll see necessarily thirty five again, but you can't rule out fifty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the reason I had these little um highlights on here was just a good example of sort of um you know don't uh, don't fight the trend because we had these little mm. sort of engulfing patterns, um, but when the trend is this steeply down, you need a bit more confirmation. It should be uh, the way I look at it is the first sign of some strengths coming back into the market, but it's not the actual final trigger to get long, um, at least on any kind of sustained basis. You know, maybe for you know if you're going very short-term trading, you look at that engulfing candle, you think maybe a couple of hours the next day you might get some further move higher, but any long-term move, you know that and this this pattern in itself, even quite a big one like that, coming off what I had as quite a long-term support, doesn't necessarily work as we're seeing. Yes, yeah. and and the other thing that I think it's important for us to 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 think about is how long could these prices stay down? I don't think you're looking at a V bottom here because you're coming out of a. Um, this is a this is being driven by a price war and by a, a war among the suppliers. Even if oil, you you may get these trading bounces, but I don't think you're going to see it come roaring back above 100 bucks anytime soon either. The uh, the Russians were out this morning with their uh, interest rate increase and saying basically they think the uh, oil could stay, could average around 80 for the next three years. So I think mm. we uh, as as traders need to start to think about as we move into next year. What does it mean to be in the lower oil price environment? Because we haven't been in the lower oil price environment for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And so, do you buy into the sort of general theory that it it is a uh, boon for the consumer? We obviously saw retail sales a bit better than expected uh, released today. Is that the first yes. sign that this is starting to take effect? Uh, absolutely, and I, I think it, it's taken some time, and, and it always does, to uh, to work its way back through to the the broader economy. Mm-hmm. But I do think you'll start to see it eventually. Prices will start to come down. We're getting back close to a dollar a liter here finally, which was uh, which is a, a a pretty substantial draw. I mean, we've been running at buck thirty for quite a long time, and uh, and so some of the prices are starting to come down. And as we start to see that work its way into a system, more money back into consumers' pockets, I do think that that's a uh, a positive for the economy uh, in the longer term, and, and actually also for for stock markets in, in the longer term as well. But it, it, right now, I, I think what you're looking at, you're in a period of short ter- shorter term volatility. But uh, but eventually, this uh, as the oil price stays stays down, uh, a, a, an oil price cut or, or the decline can do the same kind of thing as a uh, as an interest rate cut because it does uh, it does lower people's costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the the UK economy would be in a a major boom if we had those kind of oil prices. Guys, <laughs> no, we're still looking at uh, sort of. Um, I think uh, it's been averaging about a pound twenty five uh, per liter, but we're down actually now a decent amount. I think it's I, I saw one for one twelve uh, per liter, so uh, still yeah, still way above Canada. But that, you know that's taxes, so can't really put yeah. the market on that. <laughs> um, what um, you mentioned, dollar yen. Should we have a quick look at that? Because that's obviously been seeing a bit of a strong pullback. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so first of all, the... here's an example of how something can get way overbought and stay overbought. Mm. It, just because you, and it's important for us traders, the signal is not when you go overbought. The signal is when you roll back down. And similarly, yeah. when you're oversold, it's not going under. It's when you roll back up, because uh, yeah. that markets can stay overextended for a lot longer than you think. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. an interesting little triple top too, but uh, in terms of the RSI you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does seem to be. So it'll be interesting, you know, using the RSI. So we're seeing that kind of bounce just before the fifty level here. And once it does get back up into this kind of seventy type vicinity, do we see this act as a support, maybe a bit above? Um for those of you who don't use RSI, it can be an interesting one because it does it almost acts a bit like an extra uh price. Um, so maybe maybe moving into that area, that'd be a key. Yeah, I think if you, 
if you look back at October Jasper, uh, the the previous one where it broke down and you saw it break and then it, and then the retest and then it and then it dropped and you that pretty much that failed retest there uh, that failure to get back above seventy pretty much lined up when the price really did start to fall off. Yeah. Pretty much bang on. Yeah, I mean, you know, so, uh, pat yourself on the back if you did manage to just sell the price down at 110. Um, but, you know, technically, yeah, that was the point in which it, uh, it rolled over, wasn't it? I mean, this, okay, this was the high, but this was the point in which the high was, you know, we didn't see a new high. And we saw that confirmation candlestick there, the sort of dark cloud cover. And it did correspond with this touching and failure of the uh, the overbought level in the RSI. And then, you know, we came down to the old... Uh, Moving yeah, and then when we came down, you had the RSI bottom out around 40, which said yeah. your bull trend was still intact. You didn't go oversold. Yeah. So what we'll be watching for, not only do we watch the price here, but we watch the RSI. Does it, does it get back up above 70? Does it fail? And then when it rolls down, does it roll under 50 to confirm a downtrend? Does it take out 40 and, and, and so on? Yeah, yeah. The RSI uh, is an incredibly powerful tool for trading. When you, um, you know, so uh, Colin, you know, just out of interest, when you're when you're sort of timing your, um, uh, you know, your your, you know, you're timing your sort of entries in in, in the market, um, mm -hmm. you know, say we say we're looking at this benefit of hindsight, obviously, but we've got this kind of double top maybe formation here with this RSI support. Um, mm -hmm. Are you? Um, you know, are you sort of say say we break down through here, we sort of a little breakdown. Do you? Um, this is not maybe the best example of it actually, but when you see the price break down from an area that you could think is a significant area of support, say say around um, this sort of 108 type level, mm -hmm. and then you see a retest, do you you know do you are you a proponent of using the price level itself and um, placing the order around there, or are you more a proponent of waiting for some sort of uh, confirmation through an indicator? Rolling over like a like a stochastic or something or a or a candlestick pattern confirmation, you know it's kind of the pro and con ways. And I have this discussion a lot. Is well, obviously, if you get that confirmation, in this case, it's a lower price. So it's not as good to sell at, but you have a bit more information that actually the trend may continue. Obviously, the counter counter argument is that you know if you just traded off the price alone, you probably would have get a better entry, but just maybe slightly less sure that the the trend's going to continue. Yes. Yeah, I usually that's why stop losses are important because if you go in the more uh, you're right. I mean, the more indicators you have that come together, the higher your confidence level. But you you have to give something up for to to get all that that level of confidence, right? So you may go in earlier, but if you go in earlier, you have to be be in with hard stops and be prepared to to go if it doesn't work out for you. Yeah, yeah. If it and doesn't come equally. together. And normally, because, I mean, there, there's three times to answer a trade if you're looking at a pattern. One is anticipation that the pattern will go your way. One is on the breakout and one is on the retest. Yeah. So the more conservative people will wait for the retest but give up a little bit of their upside. And the more aggressive people will try and capture the upside but take on a little bit of risk. And so what's important is if you're going to go earlier is to have a plan in case it doesn't go your way and to have a stop loss in there. That's the That's the key thing. Yeah, yeah, and one of the most annoying things of uh, trading patterns is obviously the false breakout, and um, it certainly yeah. happened to me a few times where you, you know, you're feeling fairly determined about a pattern. You, you know, you trade the breakout, you get sort of three false breaks, and you think, and then the, you know, that final one when you capitulate and think, okay, that's it, I'm done with this trade. That's the one where it does break out. So it's this, uh, <laughs> it's the, the psychology. Yes, that comes indeed. Into, uh, Never fails. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, well uh, we're doing pretty. How are we looking at Go timing ahead, wise? No, I was just going to say, how are we looking at timing wise, Colin? When is this supposed to wrap up? Was it was it half um, past or was it? Um, quarter well, we usually go about forty five minutes, so I was going yeah. to say we're probably at a point where it's a good time to open the floor to questions. Okay. So I just think I hear on the on the yen. What we want to watch for is with the yen and keep an eye on gold too, is that the other thing we're finding is now that we're starting to see volatility come back, some of the complacency may start to go away. You could start to see more interest coming back into gold, back into yen than, than we've seen uh, more recently. So, so keep an eye on that as, uh, as we do get more risk and more volatility. And if, if political risk starts to come back again, then you could start to see gold and, uh, and yen get more active on that. Uh, as well, so I, I'm pretty much I'm good here. If you, there was anything you wanted to mention, Jasper, before we open the floor to questions, no, no. Um, I, well, I think I'm, yeah, I'm okay. Um, so, do do any of you chaps out there have 
chaps and chapesses have uh, any questions for, for Colin and I about the kind of things we've been discussing, or if you have a completely different market that you're trading, um, obviously throw that out there as well. Okay, so I don't know if you see these. Um, do, you see, do you see the Q&A as well, Colin? Uh, yes, I'm looking at the question here, so I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Um, Hello, uh, question. Previous Germany 30 trends have been signaled by a one-day hammer tick, on, uh, such as on October 16 or September 19, with UK 100 and US 30 corresponding. Is this a technical you would look for to confirm a downward reversal? Thanks. Yes, I keep an eye on, I look for markets and I look for confirmations, and I look whether or not it makes sense. So uh, over here, usually when, we, uh, when we're looking at, at breakouts by the Dow, you're looking at uh, industrials, you're looking at the transports for confirmation, and or the Dow and transports and industrials to confirm each other. Now, we unfortunately don't have the transports on here, but you can usually find it on um, on some of the, the the news sites like Bloomberg and things like that, or or, or stock charts. The um, so that's one that I look for. So yeah, I do look, I do think it's important that uh, that indices confirm each other, and when you get non confirmations, is uh, is quite significant. Such as we saw recently, where last week where we had the uh, the the Germany uh, trading up at new highs and uh, and the FTSE nowhere even close and you do yeah. get uh, you do I do watch for uh, divergences and, and non confirmations I think they're really important and and even in the U S I also look at the uh, the large cap indices versus the small caps so you know it's is uh, uh, like the Russell for example. Yeah. Or uh, or the Nasdaq because I look at the Nasdaq has a lot of momentum stocks on it so it tells you what's got kind of going on at the margins. Yeah, I mean, it's a good tool that um, that you guys can use that um, hopefully you're aware of, where you can just obviously overlay the uh, the charts on top of each other there, and you um, you know you can start to get a, an impression as to which one is is um, outperforming for one, but then at least even if one's outperforming the other, you know which one is um, you know is one leading the other. Um, so you know we're seeing uh, Colin mentioned the, the small caps here really not quite doing as well as their um you know more broader uh sorry as their more narrow blue chip counterparts um so you know is this sort of potential uh, head and yeah. shoulders that there's maybe going on in the in the russell in the small cap 2000s we call it is that selling us something about what's about to happen in the, the US 30 certainly may not be mm -hmm. but it's certainly worth watching you especially have to be careful with the Dow because it's only 30 stocks. You only need to move four or five stocks to move the Dow. Mm. As we've seen uh, with Exxon and Chevron of late. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't take much. You only, so you can have a Dow move concentrated in a very small number of large cap stocks. So that's one that uh, that index that I do uh, I am particularly kind of careful with when you watch and you look for confirmation. So you see something in the Dow. The first thing I do is look to the S and P, which at least is a little bit broader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I hope that that answers uh, your question there. I mean, I, I guess in terms of the candlestick pattern, um, goes back to what I was saying before. Is certainly the uh, hammer pattern is um, a hammer pattern or a shooting star. Um, you know, reversing an uptrend are definitely strong patterns, and you, with the benefit of hindsight, you look back and you see uh, where markets reversed. More often than not, you, you see a hammer there because that's just a sign of momentum. You know, the change of uh, um, power coming into the market, sellers turning to buyers, and if it all happens in the space of one one period or you know one day, whatever time frame you're looking at, all the stronger indication that change in power has taken place. Uh, but it is more like a first sign, I always think. Um, it's not the actual trigger to get in the trade itself necessarily, because if you're a bit more careful and you look back on the charts, you'll see plenty of failed hammers as well, where they, you know, could have been a perfect bottom, but actually prices just moved over the next day, or you know, whatever the case is. Fantastic. Well, this looks like a uh, a good point for us to uh, to wrap up. It's about 45 minutes since we started. So uh, I think um, basically over the next couple of weeks now, we're, we're, we're past the ECB. Next week, we could probably see some action in the U.S. around the Fed meeting. Uh, the, the speculation is on their uh, considerable time guidance between the end of QE and the start of interest rate increases. They're probably going to go back, and uh, there, there's a lot of talk that that may get changed or adjusted or they may uh, change their guidance. This is the last meeting before the voting structure changes, so it's the uh, uh, some of the hawks 
works. It's their last stand for a while until they uh, until they rotate off. Now other ones will come in, but still, you could see the uh, a bit the Hawks trying to push their agenda a little bit more while they have the opportunity, and uh, and so we'll see quite a, we, we expect to see quite a bit of action in that off of the uh, uh, that's the next big thing between now and the end of the year. Absolutely. Well, good luck trading to all everyone who attended. Thanks, thanks very much for showing up. Um, when, do you know when the next one of these uh, is, Colin? Uh, it will most likely be with uh, Colin and Michael. Uh, the next one, but I, I suppose yes, it's is. Thursday, January the wait, five, six, the fifteenth. Uh, Thursday the fifteenth. Friday the ninth will be the non-farm payrolls webinar, and Thursday the fifteenth will be the analyst debates. Perfect. Great. Well, that to look forward to. Yeah, thanks again, everyone. Cheers, Colin. Thanks. Thanks, Jasper. Thanks, everyone.